I haven't asked to leave the property, but I'm guessing that's about what's to happen. Yeah, so I think that's what they're going towards. What was your name again, sir? I'm sorry, Senator? Senator Jeff Merkley. Jeff? U.S. Senator Jeff Merkley. I've now been asked to leave the property, and so I'll, I'll comply with that. Two weeks ago, Senator Jeff Merkley tried to get a tour of an immigrant detention center at an abandoned Walmart building in Brownsville, Texas, that houses children. Senator Merkley was not allowed inside. No one would grant him an interview. But today, for the first time since Senator Merkley was asked to leave the premises, our own Jacob Soboroff finally did get a tour. He joins me now just outside that facility in Brownsville, Texas. Jacob, you were with a few other journalists let into that facility. What did you see? You know, um, Chris, I have been inside uh, federal, a federal prison before. I've been inside uh, several county jails. Uh, this place is called a shelter, but uh, effectively these kids are uh, incarcerated. There are 1,400 of them, over 1,400 of them, uh, that uh, are spending not weeks, months uh, inside this place. They're not actually literally in cages or in cells, but uh, I kid you not, one of the first things an employee of the shelter said to me is, uh, when we walked inside, can you uh, try to smile at these kids? Um, because it's weird to see people from the outside. They feel like animals locked up in cages uh, being looked at. It's, uh, it was an extraordinary thing to see. Well, what, what, so t t talk me through what's it look like. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a Walmart that's been re you know, re refashioned. Uh, is it yeah, so open air rooms with beds? Like it is. These kids are free to move around. Um, there are there are four beds. It's basically a dormitory structure. You know, it's it's not uh, not uh, nice by the standards of a place to be incarcerated. You know, it's fresh paint everywhere. There's a cafeteria for kids to go to about 300 uh, at a time. There are four beds uh, per room, uh, or at least they're supposed to be. But right now there are five. They have a variance in here uh, from the state of Texas since uh, May because of this overcrowding crisis that's been uh, created, manufactured, basically. It's a self inflicted crisis is a uh you know, our colleague Julia Ainsley was saying earlier today on MSNBC, because the Trump administration is taking children from their parents and effectively making them unaccompanied minors. Uh, this place used to be just for kids that would walk across the border for the most part, uh, virtually 100 uh, percent on their own. And now you're getting more and more kids, up to 30 uh, percent as of right now, according to one official inside, uh, that have been separated from their parents over the last uh, so couple of months. They have recreation, but they're allowed, they're allowed outside, Chris, uh, where we are in the fresh air, uh, for two hours a day. Uh, uh, and the rest of 22 hours a day, they're inside a, a former uh, Walmart. So, all right, you got 1,400 kids in there um, and, and maybe 70 percent. Again, we should be clear, unaccompanied minors is something that started and they, they, the government has struggled to figure out what to do with them. You got a 15 year old, 16 year old who's walking across the border. Now you've got kids that are being rendered unaccompanied because they're going to be taken from their parents who tend to be younger. So do we have a sense of the age range of these 1,400 kids in there? Yeah, and they're all boys, I should say, and they're from age 10 to 17. So the thing that strikes me, you know, as a parent of a two and a half year old boy is what about from zero to 10? You know, where are those kids? This is one of 100 facilities like this in the United awesome. States across 17 states. This is the, this is the largest facility of its kind uh, in the country. Um, but it is. But but there are 99 other ones. And uh, so and we're only talking about 10 to 17 year old boys in here. OK, so 10 to 17 year old. You, you're I got one boy, two girls. You got you got a two and a half year old boy. Um, you got 1400 boys age 10 to 17. Now, the ideal ratio would be 2800 adults to look after 1400 boys between those two ages. What how many adults are watching after that many boys? One to eight is the ratio. So there is one uh, staff member uh, for every incarcerated uh, shelter resident is what they is what they call them. And uh, it's it's um, it's organized chaos in there. I mean, it, it, it's 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 hectic, but it, but it is organized. And like I said, there you know, 300 kids at a time are going to the chow. That's why I say it's like looking at a prison or in a, in a jail. You know, they're all led to chow. There, there was a group of kids doing a you know, again, I kid you not, Tai Chi or recreation or a group of boys sitting in the former loading dock of the Walmart in a, in a theater watching uh, the Disney movie Moana. They're just trying to keep these kids busy. They go to class for six hours a day and learn about American history. And honestly, one of the most striking things that I saw when you go in there is that this place has a lot of American history all over the place. Quotes, inspirational quotes, I guess, um, from former presidents. And uh, the first one that you see when you walk in is, is, is Donald Trump. There's a mural of Donald Trump. That's a mural of Donald Trump with, with a quote from Donald Trump. Uh, I'm paraphrasing, talking about if you don't, you know, if you don't win the battle, there's a way to win the win the war. It's uh, it is very I mean, strange does not do it justice. Uh, what it's like in there. It's uh, let me, it's let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. Um, so you've got these. This is a nonprofit 
that has been contracted with the federal government to run this facility. Um, what is the level of training and of, of these grown-ups who, you know, watching eight boys per grown-up for 22 hours a day is like, that's very serious work that requires very serious training. Yeah, and I want to be really clear. There, I think that there is very serious work and very serious yeah. training that goes on. These are accredited, licensed professionals, not just by the state of Texas, but again, this is a licensed facility, and it brings up the much larger issue because you have teachers in here, licensed teachers, licensed uh, clinicians, uh, three on-call doctors that are in this facility or around this facility at any time, uh, a whole, a 48-person medical staff uh, that's inside here. But what's being talked about with the administration is moving or bringing children away from facilities like this, licensed facilities, and onto tent cities on federal property. And what I was told tonight is that those tent cities that are being looked at here in Texas and throughout the state of California are unlicensed facilities. It won't require necessarily on federal property because it's an emergency situation, the level of training, the types of professionals wow. uh, that are taking care of the kids that are in this facility uh, tonight when they go lights out at 9 p.m. So, um, final question. Do you know, have these kids, the ones, now unaccompanied minors are one thing, right? But of the 30%, the ones who, who, who traveled with a parent or a guardian or a grandparent and were taken away from them, have they, are there reg, regular contacts they get to have with that person? They wouldn't say regular, uh, but they said it's up. It's basically up to the penal institution where they are. Because again, remember these these kids before this policy was announced, most of these kids would end up in ICE family detention with their families, which is uh, whatever you want to think about it. They were together with their families. Right. Now they're they're being separated from their parents. They're being taken to the federal courthouse here in South Texas. Their parents are being remanded to the U.S. Marshal's custody and they go to federal prison. So if the federal prison or the, the Department of Refugee Resettlement in HHS says that that parent can call the child, the parent's allowed to call the child. But it's up to the penal institution. If uh, they, they said it happens, but it, it's not happening on a regular basis. All right, well, Jacob, this is fantastic reporting. Thank you for giving us a glimpse inside. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for staying on us, man. Jacob, you're getting a lot of attention for this report because when you toured this, and we should note that cameras were not allowed inside, only reporters with pens and pads. But after you toured this, you went on television and you said, these are basically prisons. That's exactly right. And let me do the breaking news here first, Katie. The kids that would otherwise be going to facilities like this or this specific facility, Casa Padre in Brownsville, Texas, may now be diverted because of that Trump administration zero tolerance policy that separates migrant children from their parents when they cross the border uh, in what the administration says in, as an illegal act. The first location will be at the Tornillo Land Port of Entry. That's not far from El Paso. And we have learned and confirmed with our colleague Courtney Kuby at the Pentagon uh, that 450 beds will be at that location and it will be effectively uh, a tent camp, a tent city, however you want to uh, characterize it. And the reason that those facilities are necessary and that the uh, federal government is scrambling to put them up now uh, is because of this new policy. Uh, now back to our tour yesterday, we were part of the group of journalists that was granted the first access inside this facility since that zero tolerance policy uh, was announced. And, and we're looking at some of those pictures right now. Now, there are about 1,500 young boys between the ages of 10 and 17. This is the largest such facility uh, in the country that are inside there. The vast majority arrived in the United States by themselves, but an increasing number were separated from their parents uh, when they crossed the border uh, illegally, in the words of the government. Uh, and now that number is up to about 30 percent here. Let me put it in perspective for you. About a year ago, there were only 80, 80 migrant kids inside the facility behind me. It's 250,000 square feet. It's a former Walmart. Uh, now there are nearly 1,500 kids. Part of that is because that Trump effect has worn off. People are more confident to come into the United States. Um, but a big part of it is this flood of kids being separated from their parents. And now, again, with the breaking news, uh, there will be the first tent city erected uh, because of the influx of these people in uh, the Tornillo Landport of Entry in Texas. 
One thing I do want to say, though, about this whole idea that this is a deterrence to people coming into the United States illegally, the U.S. government has tried this before. In 1994, there was an official Border Patrol policy called Prevention Through Deterrence during the Clinton administration. It built the first round of walls, fencing around urban areas. And in the document, it said, we think people are either going to stop coming or end up going in more dangerous ways where they risk their lives. Well, guess what? People didn't stop coming. They went the more dangerous ways. And the number of people dying trying to cross into the United States ended, uh, ended up going up. What do you think is going to happen now? People are not going to declare asylum uh, because they're scared of being separated from their children. So instead of declaring asylum, walking across the border between these ports of entry, you're going to have migrants that run from the Border Patrol with little kids in places like Aravaca, Arizona, or Ajo, Arizona, or around the Falfurrias checkpoint in southwest Te in uh, southern Texas. People are you're going to see an increase in people dying uh, trying to get into the United States, not a, a decrease in people trying to enter. They're just going to try to do it uh, a different way. It's it is an inhumane way to stop people from trying to come into the United States. So far, despite nearly 2,000 children being separated from their families, what's missing from this story are a flood of images of these young children. It was images of children, after all, that spurred the president to change course in Syria. So far, this young toddler has become the face of this policy. Stop and look at her for just a moment. And remember that there are thousands, thousands of other faces that we have not seen. That's in part because cameras have been granted such limited access to the facilities where these children are being held. Let's go live now to MSNBC's Jacob Soboroff in McAllen, Texas. Jacob, you have been one of the very few journalists allowed to see one of the facilities where these mi migrant children are being held. Tell us what it is that we can't see. So, Casey, this uh, building behind me is nondescript, but it's, it's probably the epicenter of this entire conversation that we are having. This is the Border Patrol Central Processing Center in McAllen, Texas, called Ursula. And inside there, right now, there are 1,200 detainees and more young children have been separated from their parents inside that building uh, as their parents leave the building than anywhere else along the southern border. And that is because this sector, the Rio Grande Valley, sees more apprehensions, more people trying to cross illegally than anywhere else. And inside this building today, we got inside uh, with another group of journalists uh, for the first time. And uh, what we saw, frankly, uh, is as shocking as everything else uh, that we have been seeing. And I want to be really clear. What's happening inside that building in terms of people being detained inside cages, and by the way, we weren't allowed to bring our cameras in, but we were given handout photos uh, from Customs and Border Protection, and maybe we can show you some of those if we have them right now. People have been detained inside buildings like this in this building for a long time, but this is the first time since, uh, this is the first time ever that children have been separated on a systematic basis. Look at those photos right there uh, from their parents, and that is because of the Trump administration. People in here are locked up in cages, uh, essentially what look like animals. Uh, kennels. I don't know any other way to describe it. And strangely, the Washington Post gave Senator Jeff Merkley what they call three Pinocchios for saying the kids were locked up in cages in here. That's exactly what I saw today. What's different than what was going on in this building during the Obama administration is the systematic separation of children from their parents under this zero tolerance uh, policy. And in this sector alone, there have been over 1,100 kids separated from their parents since the policy uh, began. We know 2,000 since early April across the entire southern border. So it's a massive amount coming out of here. Uh, in this building, what happens is parents uh, get ready to leave the building, and they don't know if they're going to ICE family detention with their children or if they get to bring uh, their children with them uh, or if they're going to go to the courthouse and get charged. And ultimately, they're basically given a piece of paper. They're taken to the courthouse. Their children are left behind here, uh, and they don't know uh, when they are going to see their children uh, ever again, frankly. I don't think that, um, you know, they're supposed to call this phone number and figure out the details, uh, and that's something that's supposed to get explained to them. But there is, there's a big mess going on right now, and even the Border Patrol inside this building says they're overstaffed, uh, they don't have enough resources. Uh, the system is just getting stressed out because the Trump administration decided to put this into place, uh, and the consequences really haven't been worked out. And, and the biggest consequence of all is thousands of young children in a way that has never been done before are taken from their parents. And when you hear the Trump administration say, this has been done before, this is a Democrat policy, uh, this is not unusual, uh, that's BS, frankly.
Jacob, were you able to talk to any of the children in the facility or, or get a sense for, for what it was like uh, for them? And, and, and how, how quickly, is there any warning for these people? I mean, you said they're just handed a piece of paper. What, what dictates what's on that piece of paper? I mean, how, is, is it, I just, I'm stuck on this idea of how terrified people must be walking up to receive whatever piece of information is going to tell them whether or not they're going to be allowed to stay with their kids. Yeah, there was a uh, there was a mother in tears there today as the group of journalists sort of came around her because we were asked not to talk to people inside without the permission of uh, of Border Patrol and there were a couple that we were able to talk to. The idea is by court order they have to be out of here within 72 uh, hours and uh, these because it's sort of a hodgepodge of rules and regulations coming together. Um, right now they're trying to get people out of this facility as fast as possible. If the parents are going to be charged. They're trying to get them either, they're trying to get them over to the federal court as fast as possible. They're trying to get the kids out of here as fast as possible into facilities run by uh, health and human services. But these scenarios are coming up that we're finding out about where a parent, for instance, might be charged. And by the way, the Trump administration, again, wants to charge 100% of the people that come into this country illegally. Right now in this sector, they're saying that that number and the separations are around 40% with the goal of charging everybody. There are scenarios where a parent might leave go to the federal courthouse, be charged and sentenced with time served, come back to this building behind me, and their kid's already gone, and they're already into the HHS system, and then they don't know how to find their child, and they don't know when they're going to find their child, and they don't know where to find their child. And so there are these inconsistencies in the way that this is all playing out that's just making these terribly painful and irrational situations that seem like they could be put together in a way that, that just frankly makes more sense. Jacob Soberoff, live in Texas, uh, thank you so much uh, for spending your Father's Day to bring us uh, this story here. Great reporting. Now, just to reiterate, our cameras are being barred from showing you what's happening inside these facilities where children are being held. The only video you're seeing is what we get from the government and what they have allowed us to see. But our colleague Jacob Soboroff has been inside, one of the few journalists allowed in. Jacob, take us inside. What were the, the things that immediately stood out to you when you were in there? There's so much debate, Lester, over whether or not uh, there are cages in there. You know, before I went in, that's what everybody was talking about. It's the first thing that you notice. They look like uh, dog kennels, and to see human beings uh, inside, there. It's not just adults, it's not just families, but it's an increasing amount of children every single day because of this separation policy. And there are those Mylar blankets you mentioned, the mattresses on the, uh, the floor, but it's not just them. The stress is on the Border Patrol agents, on the four social workers that are responsible for hundreds of children, and it's only getting more credit every single day. Here's the thing that's, that I keep wondering. How do they match them up again? I, my understanding is once they leave that facility, they're really on separate tracks. How do they get them back together? The parents are given a piece of paper. They call it a tear sheet. And ultimately, it's up to the parent to call a 1-800 number once they get out of federal detention and find their child. And you got to press one for English, two for Spanish, and ultimately hope that it works out. All right. Jacob Soberoff, thank you very much. I want to know if you've picked up uh, any clues that, that were sounding like there's something out there called a tender age shelter. I mean, Chris just hit the nail on the head, Lawrence. Inside this building that we're standing in front of, uh, 1,100 kids have been separated from their parents. I was inside the building, uh, and there are babies sitting by themselves uh, in a cage with other babies. Where are those babies going to go? Where are they going to put those babies when their parents are picked up and sent into a federal prison or a local jail and then deported, and then uh, they never come back? Uh, you want to know what happens next? Uh, the babies don't end up making it into a facility like this. The parents that would normally come with those babies don't show up to declare asylum. Uh, they decide to run from the Border Patrol instead. And the next chapter in the story is we're going to be seeing pictures of dead babies in the Arizona desert uh, and in the South Texas brush. Uh, that's what happens uh, when you put deterrence in place. And that's what's going to happen next in this story. You're going to have babies dying coming into the United States because families are scared to seek asylum because they don't want those babies to end up in tender age shelters. We've got breaking news from the White House, specifically on President Trump's zero tolerance immigration policy. I want to take you to Kristen Welker, who's live. Kristen, uh, Kristen, 
Uh, she's going to be joining us in a moment. Remember, this zero tolerance policy was put in place about a month and a half ago. There's been a lot of talk out of the White House. Let me actually bring Jacob Soberoff. And Jacob, you've been here uh, for the last week. And so many people on both sides of the aisle and faith leaders urging the president to reverse the policy. And I know you got some news. We're just hearing the, uh, the president has just said, well, I'm going to be signing something in a little while to keep families uh, together. And he said that it'll be followed up later by a legislative fix. Essentially, uh, if that's what it sounds like, he may be stopping this family separation from happening uh, right now. The question that comes to mind for me is he's undermining a policy that was put into place by his own attorney general. So what's going on inside the White House uh, right now uh, between maybe those two factions? Maybe he just changed his mind. Maybe he did change his mind. And, and, and the big question, really, frankly, which is all we really care about on the ground here, what does that mean? for the 2,500 children that have already been separated from their parents, the ones that could become permanent orphans, uh, according to a former ICE official that we talked to yesterday. If the president has decided now, a couple months later, that he that he's just doesn't like this policy anymore, um, what happens to the kids that he's already ripped away from his parents? So we have uh, about 55 miles of uh, border wall. I spoke about those kids with Manuel Padilla, the border patrol chief of the Rio Grande Valley sector in Texas. Is this a deterrent? Is that the point? Are you trying to deter people from coming by separating uh, children and their parents and prosecuting 100% of people who come here? Yes. So the point is that we have an upward uh, trend, right? So if we do not do anything, we are going to be in a crisis mode. So separating parents and kids is to put consequences on them coming here together? Yes, yes. Padilla says the administration's recent zero tolerance policy against illegal immigration is part of the overall effort to stop dangerous people who are trying to come here, like MS-13 gang members. You're talking about murderers. You're talking about very, very, uh, very violent criminals. Do you know how many MS-13 members you caught here? Uh, that have made it through? Mm -hmm. I can tell you right now we're looking at a 300% increase over last year. And how many, how many people is that? It comes out to about 100 and, I think it's 180. And how many total people did you catch last year? Last year we had 187,000 people. Mexico is extraordinarily uh, violent. But if you talk to people in San Diego or you talk to people in El Paso or you talk to people in McAllen, across from these dangerous places, they'll tell you the violence isn't coming across the border. The violence is, is staying in Mexico. Uh, we see violence every day is all I can tell you. The increase in violence, increase in stash houses, smugglers, traffickers, uh, that is a crisis. The DEA in the 2017 National Report said, and I'm quoting, while drug-related murders have reached epidemic proportions in Mexico in recent years, this is a phenomenon that has not translated into spillover violence in the United States. So do you think violence is spilling over into the United States? Along the border? Absolutely. That's not what the DEA says. I would be happy to look at the DEA materials, but I can tell you from our agents who are down there, I can tell you from talking to the governors uh, who call very concerned, uh, so absolutely the, the violence is going up. If I were to tell a family in a community, oh, don't worry about it, there's this huge threat, but it's really not that bad, most communities would say we should have zero. We should have zero criminals in our midst. Today is the day the government says every eligible parent will be reunited with their children on this day. And while it will be the end of one dark chapter for these families, their struggles are really only beginning. With our left field unit, we spent the last few weeks following one mother separated from her two boys for over a month to learn more about life after they were reunited. This is no ordinary new home for Maria Gloria and her 11 and 7 year old sons, Franklin and Byron. What did you leave behind in Honduras? I lost everything. She came to the U.S. from Honduras to escape death threats to herself and her boys. But when she got here and tried to declare asylum, she was separated from her sons for a month and a half at that processing center I saw with my own eyes. And people in here are locked up in cages, uh, essentially what look like animal uh, kennels. I don't know any other way to describe it. Two weeks ago, she was finally released from detention in Texas and headed straight for the airport in search of her sons. They had been sent to a shelter in New York City, thousands of miles away. And when she went to pick them up, faced with a media circus, she broke down. I feel like I'm dying because they've taken my kids away. A few hours after going inside to find her boys, they came out together, but uncertain of what was next. The answer, was a two-hour drive upstate to Kingston, New York.
Nueva casa, ¿eh? Sí, la nueva casa. Here, she has relatives to help her out, and others too. This is Catholic Charities in Kingston, New York, and this is where Maria Gloria and her boys have come to get help from locals in the community, figure out how to get resettled, and it all happens in here. Maria Gloria will receive services like English classes, a food pantry, and even sports for Franklin and Byron. Yesterday we gave her a bed and for her that that was terrific because she had passed so many nights sleeping sort of on a mattress on the floor. Now Maria Gloria is trying to find a job so her kids can have a new and better life here. While the immigration part plays out, there, what your job is is to offer them services, right? Yes. Yesterday when we spoke, she was very enthusiastic and said, I wanna, I'm ready, I want to start working. So how do you get the kids in school? How do you do that? We're going to do, we're going to talk with their social worker and then we're going to try to set up an appointment and hopefully we'll, we'll be there with her. Like thousands of others today faced with an uncertain future, Maria Gloria only has one thing on her mind. Now here we are, we're standing on your new block, your new street, your new house, your new city. What is that like? My biggest joy is to have my kids with me again. For Maria Gloria and her sons, a journey to run from trauma only brought more of it. But now, they hope, they're finally in the place that will bring them peace. What an ordeal they've gone through on top of the trauma that Maria Gloria and her sons are dealing with after separation. And they didn't, by the way, want to be uh, separated for one second when we were all together. They now face massive uncertainty about their asylum claim and when it will be processed because she in particular has a clean record. In the meantime, they're going to get to start a new life here in New York. And starting today, hundreds of other reunited families will be in the exact same scenario if they are not facing a far more daunting prospect, guys, like immediate deportation right after the reunion. Today. For the for the families, for the parents who've already been deported, but their kids are already here. Yeah. What happens to those children? It, frankly, honestly, it's a mess and a disaster on the scale of a natural disaster that was created by the Trump administration. 463 parents have already been deported. That's the number that they say as many as 463. The kids may be stranded here forever and not be able to get back to their parents because those parents won't be able to come back to the U.S. for a reunification. Well, all right. Wow. Jacob, I know you're going to stay on top of the story Good as work. you have been. There are still, Jacob, lots of children who are alone hundreds. by themselves. Hundreds who have been who were separated from their families under the now abandoned, essentially, family separation policy, who a judge said you have to put them back together again, and where are we on that? As of tonight, 416. And I just want to say about four, 416 children still. 416 tonight, all summer, those children have been in, uh, separated from their parents. Uh, while we've all been off, uh, you know, doing our summers, the American people, uh, President Trump has right. been going golfing, et cetera. I want to say about Flores real quick, the whole reason the Trump administration put in this family separation policy was essentially to terrorize these folks. It was the stated deterrence policy in order to get Congress to act, uh, to basically uh, get rid of this Flores policy right. so that they could indefinitely detain all of these children. That didn't work out because President Trump signed the executive order, which an administration official has told me they now uh, regret because they think they were close to getting Congress to get rid of Flores. Tonight, 416 kids still remain in the custody of the U.S. government. And then the other number that's extraordinary is they say 199 children have parents who, who knowingly waived the right to be reunited with these children. They basically gave up the kids. We know a lot of them have already been deported. Some of them are still detained, the parents, separate from the kids in the United States. I've been trying, you had it on the show. I've been trying to get in touch with one, get inside ICE detention for weeks. I finally was able to do that and we brought some tapes. So I want to roll that real quick. Let me ask you, Asensio, what they say is, look, you signed these papers. These papers say, um, I know that I'm requesting to return to my country of citizenship without my child. And I understand he's going to stay here to pursue the claims of relief. Explain to me, why would you sign this if you wanted to get back together with your son? Because they told me I would not be reunited with my son. That if I wanted to be reunited, they would have deported me. You thought the only options were be reunited and deported, or you be deported and he stays here. So you thought that's the better option? Yes. So the, the ACL Eucharist says many of these parents said that they were coerced into signing these documents, including Asensión. Because of that attorney, he was able to essentially undo this process, get a credible fear hearing, and now still may be reunited. There are hundreds of parents who have already been deported and won't, will never be as lucky as this man.